Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum. Yes, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back. And uh, we are going to be talking about uh, the continuation of chapter number six. We have uh, spoken. We have spoken about uh, uh, about fires and explosions. About the fire triangle, the differences between fires and explosions. And then we had seen uh, the flammability characteristics the lower flammability limit, the upper flammability limit, the limited oxygen uh, co concentration where we can use to find the higher and the lower limit for the oxygen limits. Uh, and by that, we can find the flammability region within the triangle, within the triangle that we try to solve uh, and find where are the areas where it's flammable or not. And then we have went into the details uh, of uh, of uh, some other flammability characteristics related to the flash point and uh, related to the sprays and mist and so on. So what we are we going to take going to take today in the video is uh, explosions, explosions. So it's the final part of chapter six. So what do we have? So explosions. We already said that the example that we have mentioned. If you have a tire, right? If you have a tire. And, and and within within this tire, if you have a little little opening here, you may have a, some kind of a release, and and this kind of a release, if I could cause that small release of energy of that pressure inside the tire, however, there's no kind of a blow or explosion there. But if you have a rupture, a big one, big rupture, and and in this big rupture, there's a lot of energy that's trying to flow out within that small area and then it blows okay it blows so that is like an explosion it happens spontaneous like really quickly so it is spontaneous uh, and 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 that means that it's an amount of like milliseconds right it is within a time of milliseconds and a big large of amount that's coming up with at that milliseconds Okay, great. Uh, so what what do we have here? Is we are talking about explosions. So it's not only the uh, the pressure. We have pressure, temperature, and many other stuffs. So what are the parameters that significantly affect the behavior of explosions? Temperature definitely would affect. So if temperature increases, definitely would affect that things could explode because it's producing more energy. Uh, pressure definitely. If you have a closed vessel, you're talking about. Uh, that closed vessel, the pressure increases, it could cause a really dangerous uh, explosion. Uh, composition of the explosive material, if it increases uh, and it is within the flammability limits, it could cause some kind of an explosion. The physical properties, of course, uh, being very volatile would affect uh, having an ignition source. Is it in a closed vessel or an open vessel would affect that this uh, th this explosion to be really damaging or not damaging uh, the amount of combustible material that means if I have something that's exploding if if the amount finishes which means because I have a small storage tank then you're going to have less damage but you have big amounts that could be a big uh, damage why? Because you're going to have a lot of energy that comes out spontaneously, uh, could cause an explosion rather than just a fire. Uh, uh, the, the time before ignition, uh, th that is also something that would affect. Why? Because maybe things get really volatile. For example, the believe example where we said that liquid is heated and heated and heated. And uh, because of the cooling system is not working till the time it it the 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 the, the storage vessel does not have the power or it, it cannot withstand that temperature it it ruptures there's a crack and then boom and boom of a full volatile compound which has a gas and an explosive liquid could be really dangerous so time before ignition could be also affecting rate at which combustible material is released okay so now it is released how fast it is released so how spontaneous and how much is the the change in the pressure that that is happening uh, within that volume uh, so all of those parameters would affect the behavior of the explosion so let's see some examples 
uh, or let's understand the explosion and then take some examples. So an explosion results from the rapid release of energy. So we know that. This energy is dissipated by a variety of mechanisms, including formation of a pressure. So because the energy comes out, it's like a pressure wave, okay? So if you were standing, there's like a wind coming to your face or it could throw you really away by this pressure wave that is coming from that energy dissipated because of the explosion, okay? Throwing you through a projectile, a thermal radiation, so it's not only pressure, it's also thermal radiation and acoustic, in, acoustic energy, that means your ears. You can hear the explosion, okay? You can feel the heat of the explosion and you can feel the pressure of that explosion. The damage from an explosion is caused by the dissipating energy. So the damage happens, why? Because of the energy that's coming out. And, and when it happens, actually when this damage or the pressure coming out from this explosion, it, it, it gives us a pressure. So uh, if, if I was standing here, whatever where I'm standing, don't worry what I'm about when I'm standing, I'm sitting at home actually, okay? <laughs> Uh, so if, if you have this blowing thing, blowing, right? Yeah, and there's a damage here, blowing. So if you take that in a figure, uh, the, the pressure at its blow could be that, but it's propagating and, 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 and which means that if you take this with a distance, so this place has the maximum pressure wave, has the maximum pressure wave, which we call here, this, this is the peak over pressure peak over pressure, okay? So talking about chemical plants, much of the damage happens due to this pressure wave that's coming out from the explosion. Thus, in order to understand explosion impacts, we must understand the dynamics of the pressure wave. So we need to study the uh, pressure wave. And, and, and here for the pressure wave, you're going to consider some easy equations rather than doing any balance equations, okay? A pressure wave propagation, which is like dp by dt, is called a blast wave because the pressure wave is followed by a strong wind, okay? So uh, we call it what? We call it a blast wave. It comes with a very strong wind. And, and it will have some kind of a shock wave or shock front. So the, 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 front, the front, which is closer to the explosion, it will have a shock then it will propagate, okay? So a shock wave or shock front results if a pressure front has an abrupt, an abrupt pressure change. A shock wave is expected from highly explosive materials such as TNT, but it can also occur from the sudden rupture of a pressure vessel, okay? So there is a shock front because you have big change in this pressure uh, uh, and then uh, you're going to have, uh, the, the pressure is going to drop later. Okay, now talking about this shock front, um, like the, 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 what we have, this damage that we have from an explosion depends whether that it is a detonation or a deflagration. And we said that detonation is higher than the speed of sound and deflagration is lower than the speed of sound. So for the detonation, you can see how that goes really highly up. Okay, and that is why you have a shock front, okay? This is very highly explosive material or a closed vessel, vessel that just blew up and, and you have maximum pressure and then drops, okay? It like drops, okay? So, so the effect could be at a shorter distance, okay? So the effect could be, the effect could be very damaging, okay? H highly damaging, right? but within a short distance, okay? What happened to my handwriting? But within a short distance. I don't mean a short distance, because comparably, comparably, that could give us uh, like still more pressure here at a, at, at a further distance, okay? And here, what do we call this? We also call it it's less than the speed of sound and we call it deflagration, okay? Not detonation, we call it deflagration. But we also have a reaction front, very similarly, but instead of saying we have a shock front going to a maximum and then drops, we have a pressure front and it propagates and then it goes down. Okay, so that is if you have, the, that is less than speed of sound. So that is the detonation and the deflagration. Okay, the explosions can have can happen in a closed vessel, 
And if it is in a closed vessel, we call it confined explosion, closed, okay? The two most common confined co explosion scenarios involving explosive vapors and explosive dust is something that we have here, which, which you could refer to as the, 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 the explosion that happens within the pistons that we have in our cars, okay? So what do we have here? Uh, we have uh, uh, some kind of a front. Let us see what, what does that mean. So we have pressure and time. Typical pressure versus time data obtained from gas explosion apparatus. So from, from, from that, where we are trying to do some experiments here, confined, it's a test apparatus to acquire vapor explosion data. So we are testing how does the exp uh, what, how does the pressure change if we explode that vapor and when we do this we do some testing and we can see how the pressure jumps and still there's an effect of that pressure and it still it propagates or i mean it's, it still has an effect and that effect is really high you can see it's over 100 psi absolute and we can see here Imagine our uh, pressure bar absolute is about six bars. That is really high. That is really high. It's not six even. I'm talking about the minimum. It's even over eight. That is really very high. So, so this is the way of for how we are identifying how does the pressure change with time. And by that we identify this is slope. This is slope. And this slope is, uh, is, is, is the change of pressure with a change of time okay and we are going to use that information in a while so this is another example pressure data from dust explosion so rather than vapor explosion now we have a pressure data from ex a dust explosion we will use another device for that and and we can see like you need sometimes some kind of energy where it ignites because some of the dust needs to have vapor and then it ignites and once it ignites it explodes and as it explodes, the pressure just jumps from this position, it jumps to other positions. So it goes from here uh, till here, and then of course it goes down. So that is the maximum uh, pressure, okay? That's the maximum pressure, but that's the maximum change in pressure. Okay, so that is the maximum rate of pressure. We want to consider that because it's one of the characteristics that we will consider. So what characteristics we need to know to understand how explosion happens. The explosion characteristics determined using the vapor and dust explosion are used in the following way. First, the limit of limit flammability. So we need to know the flammability limits, okay? LFL, UHL, okay? And we also can call those explosivity in, in the sense of explosions. So they are helping us to determine the safe concentrations for the operation of the quantity of the inert material to control the con uh, concentration within safe regions. So we already know this, LFL, UFL. The maximum rate of pressure increases indicates the robustness, robustness of the explosion. So here we are talking about we want dp by dt. And if you have high dp by dt, that means it looks like that is approaching the speed of sound and that is the, why the pressure just shoots up very highly and it also means that we have a very explosive uh, behavior uh, if we have a high dp by dt because the pressure really shoots up within a very short amount of time if we have an explosive behavior so what does it say here maximum rate of pressure increase indicates that the robustness of an explosion what do we mean by that the explosive behavior of different materials can be compared on a relative basis. So we can now compare explosive behaviors, depending on what? Depending on the dp by dt. The maximum rate is also used to design a vent, because if we know dp by dt, we can know how much we need to vent that pressure, okay? Uh, to, uh, th that is a relieving valve within a vessel during an explosion before the pressure ruptures or breaks the vessel or to establish the time interval for adding an explosive suppressant okay so giving some time uh, to suppress that explosion to put it off to putting the energy really down it's, 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 like, it's like you're stopping the combustion process to stop the combustion process okay so I hope you got it 
uh, I hope you got it. So what we need here, we need LFL, UFL, and we need DP by DT. And by knowing by DP by DT, we can compare and we can identify or design events, okay? So we can compare explosives, different material, the explosive behavior of different materials, and we can design event. And this will appear in our problems when we try to solve problems. You're going to always see that we want to design an event or we want to compare different materials and see how explosive it is. And definitely we need LFL and UHL, UFL. Okay, so a typical explosion data exhibiting the cubic law. Okay, what do we mean by that? Now, this is the equation in which we are going to use to compare uh, uh, to compare between different explosives or different materials. So what do we do? We take the maximum uh, rate of pressure, dp by dt, and we multiply by the volume to the power third, for volume to the power third. And usually it is multiply volume to the power third because it looks like something like that, right? It's a, it, it takes the shape from the explosion and it goes down and we, we thought of it that it's, that volume to the power third could be good. And uh, and they got it from experimental data, okay? So it, it, they just found that that makes really sense. So we have KG and KST. So what are these KG and KST back? So this is KG and this is KST. What is the difference? This is for vapors, this is for dust. And both of them, they have the same equation, dp by dt max into v volume to the power one third. So these are the deflagration indexes. And as we said, we, we are, these are deflagration indexes. And that is why we have considered here this kind of shape when I was talking. So these are the deflagration indexes for gas and dust. As the robustness of an explosion increases, the deflagration indexes will also increase. Okay, it will also uh, increase. Wow, okay. The cubic law states that the pressure front takes longer to propagate through a larger vessel. Okay, so if it's larger vessel, it will take longer to propagate. So this is like the pressure front and this is maximum pressure. This is dp by dt and this is how it drops down later. Okay, P max and KG and KST data for vapor and dust are shown in table 6768, which means there are some people who helped us to identify the maximum pressures and the deflagration indexes for number of gases and vapors. As we can see, for example, if we compare ammonia, ammonia, the maximum pressure it goes to 5.4, so the KG we would expect that it is like 10, it's low, I mean. But if you talk about butane, the maximum pressure is eight, but as you can see, the KG, the KG value, the deflagration index is really high, it is 92. It's 92, uh, it's not small, it's big, right? And, and now you can compare like 10 to 92, okay, that means I can understand which one can give me a higher effect, okay? A higher change in pressure, more damage. Okay, so, so, and you can see like hydrogen, if it blows, see how, how that much heat it will give. So now you're just getting an indication of how things could be explosive and, and damaging. And these are for, for the clouds, uh, sorry, for, for the dusts. And we have dust like cotton, wood dust, paper dust, uh, or even part of the food dust, milk powder, rice flour. Uh, milk, milk sugar or coal dust and because people who work in mine there, there are always problems with also explos exploding this place sometimes becomes explosive because it's confined to some extent and you have a lot of coal dust and you have a lot of sparks so you could have some kind of flammability mixture there okay so, so it, it just gives you an idea again P max we have the P max and we have the KST okay the KST which shows that how, uh, how high or low it is. So it's good for comparisons. So to be explosive, there's, this is a generic thing for you to, to just know. It's just, it is like a rule of thumb where we say that to be explosive, a dust mixture must have the following characteristics. What are they? The particles must be below a certain minimum size, typically less than 400 microns. So if it's less than 400 microns, it will be explosive, okay? The particle loading must be between certain limits. That is clear. The dust loading must be reasonably uniform. 
Okay, so it should be within a certain limit. It should be less than 400 microns and it should be uniform. That means with the, the dust is like uniform for it to propagate. So it's not in one place. It is, it is out all there, right? Within certain limits, of course, certain concentration and it is uniformly spread. It's not like one place and another place and something like that, okay? So for most dust, the lower exposure limit is between 20 to 60 grams per meter cube. And, and for the upper exposure limit, it is between two and six kilograms per meter cube. Okay, uh, these are the values that we have. Uh, now, uh, we, we, we want to know what damage we will have. Now we understand that with the equation, which, which we, where we can compare between uh, different materials, but we want to know what damage it could cause. Okay, so the explosion of a gas or a dust, either from deflagration or detonation, results, results in a reaction front moving. We said that front moving, which is pressure front or a shock wave, okay? What will happen? It, it could have that the combustion material is consumed. So the energy is like consumed, but still the reaction from front terminates. So the reaction front finishes because the combustible material finishes, but the pressure wave is still there. Okay, the pressure wave is still there and continues its outward movement. Okay, uh, so we still have a pressure wave. We will still have a pressure wave and we want to know what damage could that cause. A blast wave which comes with a pressure wave and wind, we want to see what damage it could cause, this blast wave. So shock wave, pressure wave, blast wave, blast damage. <laughs> Zane, I didn't say any bad word here, right? It's blast damage, okay? Uh, is based on the determination of the peak side on overpressure. So the overpressure will also affect whatever it is impacting, it's hitting. Okay, what is hitting? It could be a building, it could be a person, it could be anything. And, and then we calculate the number of deaths, of course, if you want to, if there are people there. The damage estimates based on overpressure are given in table 69. Okay, so that is one of the things that, like if you look, you will get a lot of information there. So what does it say here? Damage estimates for common structures based on overpressure. Now, we already have the information of overpressure or we can calculate it as well, okay? Uh, so again, uh, if you go back, so here it tells you what is the P max, okay? Here it tells you what is the P max, the maximum pressure. But actually, we also can calculate the overpressure, which, which is uh, simply the, the maximum. Uh, we are using the Pmax uh, as uh, in our calculations, and and based on the overpressure value, uh, we can uh, find some kind of an estimation. Okay, so so let's see. Sorry, let's see what we can have here. Uh, I'm trying to zoom in so that it becomes easier for you uh, so that okay great so it's not as as clear that as I expected here but here it says that if it is 0.14 kilopascal okay if you just want to compare what is the atmospheric pressure uh, ah, here it is gauge uh, hopefully it's that. So if that's gauge that is different. So that we are talking about what is above the atmospheric pressure. So it's 0.14 that is above the atmospheric pressure. That would cause annoying noise. It's 0.21. It will break windows. If it's 0.28, it's a loud noise. Uh, of course, it will cause some like sonic boom, something that hits your ear. Very loud noise. Glass, of course, failure. 0.69 breakage of small windows okay uh, 1.03 uh, typical pressure for glass breakage and let's go down there right 2.76 limited minor structural damage okay let's go even there nine steel frame slightly distorted oh my god steel let's go to 4.8 less minor damage to house structures so we have now damage to houses and now we have damage to the steel. And 13.8 is could be damage to the concrete. Oh my God. And of course, if it goes higher and higher, 
50% destruction of brickwork of houses, heavy machines also get whatever uh, bro broken and so on. So here we can see that uh, there is a good study here in which you can you can identify the, the damage that will happen because of that overpressure that you have. Okay, great. Now, now for, to, to ease the calculations that we have, to ease up calculations, uh, we, can, we already know, uh, already know, I'm, I don't mean that all of us know, but we, we will know, and, and this is how things are known to us, that we know how much energy is given by by an by exploding one gram of TNT, and that is one one two zero calories per gram. Okay, and by knowing that information, now I can see anything that explodes. What it what is its equivalence to this TNT? And by knowing its equivalence, I could expect what damage that it would cause, okay? So I'm just trying to bring the, this idea uh, closer to our, uh, to our mind. So what equation do I have here? I have an equation, I have an equation which is called scaling law, scaling law. And this scaling law, which is ZE, is equal to the R, which is the radius or the distance, because it's the distance, because the pressure, it hits as circles, right? It goes through all directions. So it's like a radius, but it's a distance, uh, for the same distance from any location, from the center location. So R is the distance, M is the mass of TNT, and ZE here is like the scaling law, so we can calculate the scaling law and this scaling law is good so that we can do some kind of the equivalence okay to fourth TNT explosion uh, so the units of ZE is mass per kilogram to the power third and if I do want to do the conversion just this not this in your notes that if I want to convert from feet per pound to the power of third to, um, uh, to mass uh, sorry, to meter per kilogram to the power third, I just multiply by 0 0.3967. Great. What else do I have in equation? So I have one equation there, the scaling, and then I have the scaled overpressure. Okay, the scaled overpressure, which is given by uh, the scaled overpressure, the scaled pressure here, you can see PS, is equal to P0, which is the peak side over pressure over the ambient pressure that is less like one atmospheric okay so that is the peak side over pressure and the ambient pr uh, pressure so we can find ps we can find ps great uh, i know that you didn't get the, the the whole idea but you will get the idea when we solve problems okay so uh, what do we have uh, because i had this in mind this is why maybe things was clearer to my head and hopefully now it's getting clear to you. If we find the scaled distance, okay, ZE, and we have the scaled over pressure, okay, one of them will give me the information of the other one, okay? One of them will give me the information of the other one. And if I have the scaled pressure or the scaled distance, I can find what? I can find uh, the, the, the over pressure, the over pressure over pressure that's p naught here okay so this is uh, uh, this is the figure between the scaled distance and the scaled over pressure if you don't want to use the figure you can use this equation here but believe me believe me it's much easier to use the figure much easier to use the figure and of course if if uh, we multiply it by 0.5 if this explosion happens in the open air okay so what do we want we want to go and solve a problem. So what is the procedure? The procedure for estimating the overpressure at any distance R resulting from an explosion of an, any mass of material is as follows. Compute the energy of the explosion. So the energy of explosion, or you can say for any material, it is the heat of combustion. Sometimes we take the lower one or the higher one, depends on what assumptions we are taking. Compute the energy of the explosion using established thermodynamic procedures. So it's simply saying that 
we know that explosion what is the energy of explosion for of TNT right we know for TNT but for other materials for other materials what we, we can use we can use the delta heat of 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 uh, combustion, uh, combustion okay we convert the energy okay we convert that energy of explosion now as if we don't have tnt so we convert that the delta heat of uh, of of compost uh, of combustion to an equivalent amount of tnt so we know that this energy how much is in comparison to tnt after we do this kind of equivalent amount of tnt we use the scaling law and the correlations of figure 623 to estimate the overpressure okay so we we can find ps we find ps and from ps we can find p naught okay and uh, and before that we already had the scaling which is ze and then we use the table uh, to estimate what to estimate the damage so in order to know how much damage do I have, I need the overpressure. To know how much overpressure I have, I need the scaled uh, pressure. Uh, and to know how much scaled overpressure, I need the scaled distance, which is ZE. You can see how this really goes. Uh, uh, and let's say an example. So one kilogram of TNT. So now we are talking about TNT, okay? So TNT is exploded. Compute the overpressure at a distance of 30 meters from the explosion. So what do we have here? The value of the scaling parameter is determined using equation 625. ZE, the scaling distance, is equal to R over the mass to the power third. 30 meters, the distance of 30 meters, divided by one kilogram, one kilogram of TNT. It gave me the scaling uh, ZE, okay? It gave me the scaling ZE. Now from the scaling ZE, which is 30, so I would go back to the figure. Okay, what is Z is 30, 20, 30, you see 20, 20, 30, we go here, here, here. So that will be here, 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 uh, so it is 0 0.055 so that is the scaled overpressure now knowing the scaled overpressure if we can recall what is this equation the equation was PS is equal to P naught over PA so PS is equal to P naught over PA and here if, if I want to have things like in kilopascal, so now what, what was my answer? The scaled over pressure is 0 0.055. So, so this is 0 0.055, right? This is 0 0.055. And the ambient, for example, temperature is 1 or 1.3 kilopascal. Okay, kilopascal. And I'm going to calculate the overpressure. Overpressure is PS multiplied by PA, which I found was 5.6 kilopascal and from table 69 5.6 kilopascal will cause what will cause minor damage to house structures if you want to look at that 5.6 kilopascal which is which is that it just exceeds the 4.8 which is minor damage to house structures okay so that how beautiful i don't mean how beautiful to damage things i mean i mean it is it is the knowledge how, how beautiful to see that the, the knowledge that we have can help us to save the lives of people, okay? So now let's see the TNT equivalency in, in terms of mass, okay? Because we also need that in our calculation to consider the damage. And let's see that in a moment. TNT equivalency is a simple method for equating a non-energy of a combustible fuel to an equivalent mass of TNT. So, the, uh, so what we are trying to do here, we are equating the energy of a combustible fuel to an equivalent mass. This approach is based on the assumption that an exploding fuel mass behaves like exploding TNT on an equivalent energy basis. So we are just assuming that as a good assumption. A typical value is a good assumption because both of them explode, okay? Cause us that pressure wave and blast wave. So a typical value for the energy of explosion of TNT is 1120 calorie per grams. This is uh, with unit conversion. It's this value and that value. Not all of them because you may need any one of them and you don't want to headache your head 
uh, by doing the unit conversions. The equivalent mass of TNT is estimating by the equation. So now we have the third equation. Okay, so we have the ZE and then we have uh, the other equation which is PS is equal to, so this is the first equation, Z is equal to R over mass of TNT to power third. The second equation is PS is equal to P naught over PA. And the third equation that you need here is that M TNT is equal to nu. And this nu that we have, is it is usually 0.05. Is 0 0.05 it is if it is an open to air and it will be one if it will be one if it is closed system okay uh, so the equivalent mass uh, is this equation so this will be 0 0.05 over one m which is the mass of that hydrocarbon that I have a delta heat of combustion which is the energy of the explosion so this is like the energy of the explosion we will take it as the heat of combustion okay and sometimes we take the higher one because heat of combustion also has like a lower and higher limit and this is the energy of tnt so we are saying what we are saying simply here that the mass if you if you want to look at that this is like mass mass tnt multiplied by e tnt is equal to mass of the hydrocarbon into the delta heat of combustion hydrocarbon and then what do we do we multiply it by a correction factor okay so it, it looks exactly the same we are just equating them uh, so that we can find an equivalent uh, mass uh, for the TNT and these are the steps that we are going to throw, go through uh, I think so you just note these steps the first thing is to Determine the total quality, a quantity of flammability material in the explosion. Estimate the efficiency 0.05 or 1. Use the scaling law that we have uh, for, for ZE and the figure, which is that. This is the ZE and this is the figure uh, that we have. Use table 69 to see how much damage do we have. Okay, can we see an example? Yes, I think so with examples. Things are always better. So example 611. 1,000 kilograms of methane escapes from a storage vessel. It mixes with air and explodes. Oh my God. So what we are going to see here now, we want to see that this 1,000 kilogram of methane, after it explodes, what will happen? So that's an hydrocarbon. Determine the equivalent amount of TNT. So if you want to know how much is that kilogram causing a damage, we understand how much damage from TNT. So we need to equivalent. So equivalent, uh, we need to equate to it, uh, to the mass. So the mass of TNT is equal to new, uh, it is substituted at 0 0.02, 0 0.05 is, uh, uh, is usual, but here it told us in the problem that it is 2%. So 0 0.02 multiplied by mass, 1000 kilogram, delta heat of combustion, you get it from appendix B for methane, and this is just a conversion. And, and you just divide by the energy of TNT, of explosion, and you will get the amount. So here we know, now we can understand, oh my God, this is 214 kilograms of TNT. You see, the feeling is different. Why? Because we understand how TNT really explodes. So we can compare what effects. Now with this 214 kilogram of TNT, which is MTNT, we can find the scaling, the scaling, uh, distance which is 8.4 and by knowing the scaling distance we use the figure to find what to find PS okay so we use the figure to find PS and PS oh, was found to be 0.25 and that is 0.25 we multiply by the ambient temperature and we found that the overpressure is 25 kilopascal and if you go to the table uh, six nine to the table six nine you're going to find that this overpressure will demolish the steel panel buildings that means the whole building will go down okay so you, you got an idea of how this calculation can help us to understand how a damage that it could cause okay now all what we have taken was about explosions that happen uh, through some kind of a, uh, an, a, a gas vapor or dust exploding somehow yes we there are other types of explosion for example we have mechanical explosions and and here 
if you have a mechanical explosion, if you want to calculate the energy, because we don't have delta heat of combustion. And since you don't have delta heat of combustion, you need to use what? You need to use this E, energy. We need to calculate the energy of explosion. Why? Because we don't have delta heat of combustion. It's mechanical explosion. And there are four different ways of calculating what? It's for calculating the mechanical explosion. So you can use this or that or that or that. Okay, all of them will give us a different answer, sometimes close to each other, sometimes different. I'm just saying that these are four different ways. Just to know the parameters, this is like P1 and the new burst pressure P2. Okay, gamma is very well known uh, for us. It is the heat capacity ratio, and this is the volume of the expanding gas, and you just do this equation and multiply. R, of course, if you're going to use this equation, R is just the, 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 the constant universal constant and you can see like each one of them will give us a different uh, a different trend which means that each one of them is different broadest equation because it is the simplest of all it's a simple equation it is most widely used okay but it doesn't mean that's more accurate okay so these are the different uh, uh, way of uh, this is the way of how to calculate the energy of explosion for what for a mechanical explosion now we can have also a missile damage. What do we mean by that? This is an explosion occurring inside a vessel, confined, closed vessel. Uh, and, and that can rupture, of course, the, the, the vessel structure. So all we have, we have taken before that was what? Was all for an open system. Now, if it is a closed system, uh, of course, the new efficiency of explosion is going to be one. That's the first thing that you can put. And of course, many people are going to get really affected. Unconfined explosions create missiles. Missiles, that means this, this more particles that are flying away because of this high pressure and high energy that could hit any person and kills them, right? Or could hit any building and breaks that building. Uh, so the missiles by that blast wave and of course impact and subsequent translation of structures. So if you want to just look at that massive explosive, let me say that Clancy, Lee, one of the guys, uh, developed an empirical relationship between the mass of explosive and the maximum horizontal range of the fragments. So how far the horizontally the fragments can flow? If this is the mass of explosive, equivalent mass of explosive of TNT, this is how far it can go. So it can go as far as 5,000 feet depending of, of course, the amount of the mass of explosive. So we need sometimes this information just to know how far it can go and how far could the damage reach. And of course, if it goes very far, that means people can be injured, injured from that direct blast or from a very far place, okay, from a very far place. So people can be injured from the explosions from direct blast effects or indirect blast effects. That is from the missile damage. Blast damage effects are estimated using probit analysis. If you go back to chapter 2 and chapter 3, we can calculate from section 2-6 how many people are going to be dying because of the blast damage, okay? An example, a reactor contains uh, 10,000 pounds of TNT. If it explodes, estimate the energy injury to people and damage to structure 500 feet away. So people are sitting 500 feet away. So the damage happens here and I'm standing here and the distance I'm standing away of many people is 500 feet. So if this thing is about 10,000 pounds, if it's 10,000 pounds, if it explodes, what injury it will cause for me here? So now I can calculate what, uh, uh, think of it the other way around, right? Because what do I need? I need the overpressure here, the P naught. If I need the P naught, I need the PS. If I need the PS, I need the ZE, right? I'm just going back to the way of how you could think about it, just going from back to the front. So the over, how do, how do we do this? We calculate the scale distance. Uh, we have 500 feet over 10,000 pounds. We find that it is 9.2. After we find ZE, from the figure, we find PS. The scale over pressure was 0.21. We multiplied by the atmospheric pressure and we found that 0.1 to 14.7 uh, 
you're going to find, uh, I didn't put the answer, you're going to find that would be like three something. Okay, so we are going to identify. So now, yes, that is 3.1 PSIG. From table 6.9, we can look at that if we have 3.1 PSIG, injury to personal is determined. Uh, of course, it, it indicates that the steel panel buildings will be diminished. So if you have 3.1 PSI gauge, what does that mean from table 69? It says that we will have steel panel buildings demolishing. Well, the injury to personnel uh, will also cause some kind of, uh, 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 people are going to die. So it's not only the steel buildings, people are going to die. How to calculate people uh, who will be dying? So we say that we need to calculate from the probit equation. So the probit equation for death resulting from the lung hemorrhage, Nazif Dakhli, Y is equal to minus 77.1 plus 6.91 lin P. So do we know the pressure? Yes, of course we know. Oh, we also can calculate oh, the air drum rupture as well, which is this equation, this equation here. So what is the P? P is 3.1 PSI. If we just do some kind of unit conversion to 21,400, Neat Newton per meter square, which is Pascal. Newton per meter square is Pascal, by the way. Okay, so this is this is Pascal, and uh, so minus seventy-seven point one plus minus plus six point nine one. You substitute here the P. We'll find that the Y death is minus eight point two. No one will die, and the air drum is three point six four. That means some people is going to have a problem with the air drum. Okay. Uh, so T4, uh, table 2-4 converts the probit to percentages. The results show that there are no deaths and less than 10% of the exposed people suffer air drum ruptures. This assumes complete conversion of explosion energy. Of course, we are saying that the explosion energy, it, it, everything goes to explosion energy. That's energy. It did not go to something else. Nothing was on the way. There's no building on the way. So uh, we are just assuming that this is like a complete conversion of explosion energy. And based on 626, this explosion could blast fragments as a max, at a maximum distance of 6,000 feet. Imagine, huh? what is figure 626? So if I have 3.1 PSI gauge, if you can remember here, if I know the mass, sorry, if I know the mass, I can see how much distance. And that this is the distance that it can go, which is about 6,000 feet feet away just by looking at the mass uh, the mass that I have here which is 10,000 uh, pounds okay uh, so so that was about the explosions so what do, do we have some other explosions yes we could have some vapor cloud explosions and that will be very uh, dangerous and uh, and by the way uh, it's it, the calculations for doing that is very similar to the others but we need to mention that it's very dangerous. So these explosions occur in a sequence of steps. So that what happens, the vapor cloud, so you have vapor and then you have a lot of vapors in the atmosphere and sudden release of a large quantity of that flammable vapor from a vessel and it could be a, a liquid and suddenly it's ruptured and a lot, a lot of flammable vapors goes out and this dispersion of vapor with air, with that, uh, with any flame, it will just explode and this ignite, ignite, ignition could cause an explosion. And we call this kind of an explosion that belief and we already explained that belief. So the most common type of belief is caused by fire and, and a fire heating up a liquid which is volatile and then the, 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 the vessel cannot withstand that. And then what happens is that when the fire heats the wall of the tank, the, the tank ruptures uh, and and, uh, and and then the flames reaches the tank in some way where there's only vapor and no liquid to remove the heat. The tank metal t t rises t and until the tank loses its structural strength, the tank ruptures and all the explosive vapors uh, goes outside. Great. So this is uh, what we have uh, for our chapter six. I think so we have went through very good examples all we need to do all what we need to do now is solve some more problems in chapter 6 up to that uh, I hope that you have gained a lot from this chapter 
I know that it's very interesting to keep it very practical and I think that you felt the practicality of this chapter. Thank you very much. I'm sure that you have gained a lot from this course, the chemical process safety course. Thank you very much. I appreciate your presence and listening. Dr. Bassam Al-Hamad, Chemical Engineering, University of Bahrain, Mass. Salam.